Most of your faces are familiar. I am Father Jeff Tunnicliffe, the pastor here at Immaculate Conception. And we're here to talk tonight about prayer. So, of course, we should start with prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we gather this night to deepen in our faith, to seek to know you better in our lives of prayer. Help us to open our hearts always to you, to listen to you, to hear your calling in our lives, to think about how we come to you in prayer, how we speak and how we listen as we pray this night. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Tonight's talk is called Talking to God, a conversation about prayer. But even just the title was um, generating a little conversation among the evangelization team, whether we call it talking to God or talking with God. Often when we think of prayer, I think we say in prayer we talk to God. But for me, prayer really should be talking with God, that we give God a chance to get a word in. Sometimes we get busy, we rattle off word after word, and we give them a list of our needs, and we never give God a chance to respond to us. So really what we're talking about is talking with God. At my previous presentation about my own faith journey, some of the questions asked about prayer, particularly dryness of prayer, and a frequent question I get at various times, people will say, well, Father, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. My prayers just don't seem to get answered. So from that, we started thinking about, okay, let's do a talk on prayer. And I think it also fits the fact that we're in the midst of our year of prayer declared by Pope Benedict the 16th. The year of faith, you know, to deepen our faith, to re try to open ourselves to new things in our faith, and certainly our prayer lives should be part of our faith. So again, we think about prayer. Now for the disclaimer. I'm going to say I do not consider myself an expert in prayer and in any way. I do have experience in prayer, and what I want to talk tonight is really about our attitude in prayer. You know, as Catholics, we have lots of rich traditions of devotions and prayers. You know, the rosary and divine mercy chaplets and... Um, Sacred Heart devotions and First Friday devotions, First Saturday devotions, various prayers we can say. And we can pray for the intercession of the saints as we venerate them. Lots of different options for us. We need to find what works for us. I think here, of like, in my own life, I think of the Liturgy of the Hours that I pray as a member of the clergy and religious play, monasteries pray, and lay people can pray the Liturgy of the Hours. For those not familiar with the Liturgy of the Hours, it's based largely on Psalms from the Book of Psalm and some canticles from other parts of scriptures. There's other readings from scriptures in it, some intercessory prayer, um, various items. Some, if you do the Office of Readings, there's prayer from early church fathers in there. But the thing I really most like about it is it invites you to pray throughout the day. In monasteries, they pray seven times a day using the Liturgy of the Hours, also known as the Divine Office. I pray it, um, actually I pray four times a day with the Liturgy of the Hours, or I strive to. It doesn't, sometimes the schedules, like we, we all know, can get in the way. But in the morning, I always pray the Office of the Readings and morning prayer together. Some people will do them separate. Daytime prayer, evening prayer, and night prayer. Uh, and the idea of that that I like is, pr again, praying throughout the day. One of the other forms of prayer we have in the, the Catholic Church, because of our belief in the real presence, 
is exposition of the Blessed Sacrament, adoration, where we take the Blessed Sacrament and place it in the monstrance upon the altar. And we can spend time in prayer, either privately, just quietly ourselves, or together praying a holy hour. And when I first found out about this practice, I tried stopping in the church a couple times, and I go in where it's just quiet time. I go in and I'd kind of go in and say, okay, yeah, I believe in the real presence. There's Jesus on the altar. Something's going to hit me. This is going to be big. And he sat there for like 10 minutes, frustrated, and got up and left. <laughs> um, same type of experience a couple times. Went off to seminary on orientation weekend. They had a holy hour that we were required to go for, exposition of the Blessed Sacrament. The last 10 minutes or so, we prayed night prayer together. But the rest, everybody was expected to be there, but each person was doing their own thing. And just so you know, when you do this, you could, people, some people bring a Bible and read from the Bible. You can bring a spiritual book. Some people pray the rosary. You don't, you're not just necessarily sitting there in silence doing nothing. Some people do that. Well, but I was there for this hour, and um, I was fit to be tied. I kept thinking, oh, come on, something's got to happen here. Something's got to happen. Nothing happened. So after that time... I said to God, I said, that's it. There's an, there's an optional holy hour every week in seminary with exposition. I said, I'm going to go one more time. I don't expect anything to happen, and when nothing happens, that's it. No more. No judgment on exposition, adoration. Just said, it just doesn't work for me. <laughs> I went. I did take a Bible with me, if I remember right, and was reading some from it, and prayed, and listened. And it ended up being the best prayer experience I had in several months at that time. I think the difference was I went in expecting nothing to happen and just saying, whatever happened, happens. Um, and God used that. Where before I kept going in expecting something happened, not necessarily something particular, but when we have expectations and they're not met, we say, well, we say nothing happened. But... Sometimes a lot can happen if we just open ourselves. And that's where I think, really, prayer, we've got to think about our attitude in prayer. What is it that we come thinking prayer is going to do for us? You know, as again, listing all our needs, praying for all the people we know who need our prayers. That's all good. But do we come, again, talking to God, or do we come to talk with God? And for me, that prayer, again, is very much about a conversation with God. And when I say a conversation, it isn't that I think I hear voices when I pray. I haven't lost my mind. <laughs> At times, I think God does speak to me in prayer. Unfortunately, he seems to do it in my voice, so I can't tell my thoughts from what he's trying to tell me. Um, I wish he would use a different voice so that I can this is God. Listen to this one. This idea is good. But that's part of the struggles in prayer. And we do face struggles in prayer. Sometimes the questions about prayer say, Father, I don't even know where to begin. You know, sometimes it's, you know, we haven't been to church in years, Father. Where do I start to pray? Sometimes there's people who go to church every Sunday but don't pray much else during the week. Partially because you don't know where, again, where do I begin? Often in prayers, we can be, I don't think my prayers get answered. What good does it do if my prayers aren't answered? And the Catholic Catechism of the Catholic Church speaks here of failure in prayer. But not that we're actually failing in prayer, but that we feel like, we, okay, my prayers just aren't doing any good. I'm a failure in prayer. But sometimes, again, you know, it's, we have to think about what we're praying for. And when I mention the Catechism, I do want to mention, explain the catechism a little bit for you in case you're not familiar with it. This is the catechism of the Catholic Church, officially the official church catechism of the entire Catholic Church. The, if you have, see one with a green cover, it came out in 1997 as the second edition. Um, it first came out um, 20 years ago. The first edition was a tan edition. Basically, everything in the tan edition, if you happen to have one of them, it is correct. They just added some information in this one um, and 
tweaked a few things. Um, so if you have one of those old ones and you look up the, ver the paragraph numbers, they may not match exactly, but the information is the same information. If, when you look inside one of these, um, when I cite the catechism tonight, I'll be citing paragraph numbers. Generally, we're like when we cite books, we're doing it by page number here. But if you look at a catechism, there's, it's all broken into paragraphs, and each one has its own number. So if you look at the reference sheet we're making available for you tonight there for the catechism reference, it's that paragraph number that it's citing. This can be a wonderful resource. Um, it's not necessarily a book to sit down and read. You can, but it can be um, somewhat can be difficult reading to understand a place to start. Um, knowing that, um, and actually when the Catholic Church came out with this as a whole, the Vatican um, encouraged individual bishops' conferences to come up with a catechism for each country, for each conference. This is the catechism for the United States, United States Catechism, United States Catholic Catechism for Adults. This came out around 2006. It follows this. The order is exactly the same as this. This cites this. And paragraph numbers, it quotes it. Everything is in agreement with it. This is written more like a book. It's written in chapters so you can sit down and read it. So if you're looking for a place to start, this can be a great, pl better place to start. If you're looking for lots of information, very concise, this can be. Um, and there's an excellent index in this, too, so when you want to find information. So I just want you to be mindful of that resource. And there, actually, if you're into the e-readers today, like the Kindle and the Nook, you can get these on them. And if you're nifty enough to have a smartphone, you can get these on your smartphones, too. And I actually have a Bible on my smartphone, too. So I have the Bible with me everywhere I go and the catechism wherever I go. So just to be mindful of that in our references tonight. Sometimes, going back to our topic of prayer, we think of prayer, you know, and we see like, we're not getting anywhere in our prayers. And here the Catechism speaks in 2573. It makes reference to Jacob's wrestling with a man that we read about in Genesis. And talks about wrestling with God. And sometimes our prayer can seem to be that. We're really wrestling in our prayers. And sometimes... It's to even figure out what we should be asking, what we should be doing in our prayer. Sometimes I think that wrestling can be figuring out what we're asking for versus what God's will is. And sometimes in that we think we should win. But we should remember God is the one who is all-knowing. It's best if God wins the arguments we have with him. <laughs> we can also speak about our struggles in prayer as dryness in prayer. You know, Father, I come to Mass, I, I'm there every Sunday, but I don't always feel like any, anything's really happening. I'm too distracted, or I just, nothing seems to hit me. You know, or if we're trying to pray on our own, you know, we just, I can't seem to get in tune with God. What's wrong with my prayer? Well, this reminds me of Blessed Mother Teresa. Some of you may be familiar that in 2007, they published a book that um, compiled some of her journal writings. Called, the book was called, Come Be My Light. And when they published it, people were shocked when it came out. Because in her journals, Mother Teresa talked about having dryness in prayer. Times when she, couldn't, she didn't feel like God was present. And they say, you know, how could Mother Teresa, you know, she's such a saintly woman, how could she have times like that? Oh, surely it must have just been like once in her life. It was for months at a time when you read that journal. You know, so sometimes it can be a struggle for all of us to be aware of God's presence for some various reasons. And I think here of a book I read a few years ago by Gerald May called Addiction in Grace. And when he spoke of addiction, he wasn't speaking so much of like drug and alcohol addiction, but addiction of our behaviors. And how when we get addicted to certain behaviors, those behaviors can mess up our relationship with God. But he also speaks of being addicted to God in there. If you're going to be addicted to something, certainly God is something to be good 
to be addicted to. But the struggle, with, if you're familiar with addictions, is when we get addicted to something, sometimes we keep needing more and more and more to get the same effect. And I think our awareness of God's presence in this way sometimes can be that. I know when I came back to church after many years of not going, I felt like on fire with the Spirit a lot of the time. And as time went on, not so much. But I don't think it's necessarily that God is with me less or the Spirit's energizing me less. We get used to it. And we really need more to get the same effect. So sometimes, you know, when we've been praying for a long time and it just doesn't seem to be doing the same thing for us, it's because we've gotten used to it. And that's where we have a great advantage with the Catholic Church that we do have so many different devotions. Because then sometimes it can just be a matter of finding a new devotion that does something new for us. Gets us to think about God in a different way. And we think about too when we're drawing this in prayer, are we limited in where we're looking for God? I think of the story with Elijah in 1 Kings 19. It comes right after his battle with the prophets of all, where he defeats them with, by God's power. But now he's fearing for his life and he goes off to hide because he's afraid people are going to come and get them. And God comes to him. And this is what we read beginning in verse 9. There he came to a cave where he took shelter. But the word of the Lord came to him. Why are you here, Elijah? He answered, I have been most zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. But the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Then the Lord said, Go outside and stand on the mountain before the Lord. The Lord will be passing by. A strong and heavy wind was rending the mountains and crushing rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire, there was a tiny whispering sound. When he heard this, Elijah hid his face in his cloak and went and stood at the entrance of the cave. A voice said to him, Elijah, why are you here? He replied, I have been most zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. But the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to the sword. Where was God present in this time? First came the wind. At times, and there are stories in the Bible of God being present in the wind. I think of the Holy Spirit rushing down at Pentecost. But this time with Elijah, God was not in the wind. Then there was the earthquake. Think of the earthquake with, at Christ's death on the cross and the ground shook. God was present in that moment. But this time, he was not present in the earthquake. Um, then came the fire. And at times, God's present in the fire. The story of the burning bush, the tongues of fire at Pentecost. But this time, God was not present in the fire. God appears. God comes to us in different ways. We cannot be stuck in expectation of God coming in one particular way. And we need to God, give God a quiet moment to speak to us. How was God present in this time to Elijah? In a tiny whispering sound. That if Elijah just kept talking and going and going and going, he never would have heard. So we need to give God that chance to say something to us. To appear to us in the way that he chooses to. Really, for me, prayer in a large way is about being in the presence of God. The Catechism in paragraph 2565 says exactly that. In prayer we seek to be in the presence of God. Of God. So how do we come to prayer in our own lives? Where do we pray can be the first question we ask. These are logistical things. Where do we pray? And I spoke 
of before, of praying with exposition of the Blessed Sacrament. You know, to pray right in church before the Blessed Sacrament can be a wonderful thing. But God is present everywhere, so we can pray anywhere. But I believe we really do, at times, need to have special places to pray. Pray. We need to be open to God, praying, praying to God's presence anywhere, but to have a special place for it, a place dedicated for it. I think of a conversation I had a few years ago with a woman who at that time um, had three teenagers living at home there with her husband and not a particularly big house. And she had one corner and one room where she would go to pray. And when she was praying in that corner, everybody else knew they better not bother mom. <laughs> so sometimes, you know, when we live in a house of various people, that's what we need to do is have a set place that the people know not to bother us when we're praying in that spot, unless, of course, the house is on fire. <laughs> but to be, find that spot. And even I live alone. And I have one room in my house where... I don't have a TV. I don't do any work in that room. Pretty much all I do in that room is pray. And that's deliberate. Because when I try and pray in the room where the TV is, I turn the TV on. It's a little hard to pray sometimes when the TV is on. Talk about distractions. But to have that special place where we go to pray, and I'm not, you know, I'm not looking at the TV, I'm not looking at work I gotta do, and I'm not looking at the mess someplace to clean up or something. Just th thinking about the prayer at that time. We can think about time of prayer, especially going back to that question, where do I begin, Father? I haven't prayed in a long time. And some people want to say, oh, I'll go right for the hour of prayer. Oh yeah, we have exposition of the Blessed Sacrament on Friday. And by the way, we re this week we really do have exposition of the Blessed Sacrament on Friday morning. Um, I'm going to go and spend an hour there. I'm going to give that hour to the Lord. Sometimes that works. Sometimes, though, we need to set realistic goals. Start, say, with 10 minutes a day and build up with the time. What time of day? Well, if you're starting with just once a day, t 10 minutes a day, whatever works works best for you that you can commit yourself to. But then expand. Don't just stay with 10 minutes a day forever. You might go to 20 minutes. Or you might stick with 10 minutes, but do it twice a day. But to build that attitude of praying always. In 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul says to pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing does not mean we pray 24 hours a day, you know, rosary after rosary, or go from the rosary to the Divine Mercy Chaplet, to this to that. No, pray without ceasing, again, is a question of our attitude in prayer. That we're thinking about God throughout the day. Thinking about God when we're making decisions. You know, when we make a significant decision in our life, do we even give God a chance to chime in His opinion? So to be thinking about God throughout the day. But then the counter to that, I hear, I hear some people who especially work in church say, well, in that sense, my work is my prayer. Well, especially if you work in church work or charitable work, hopefully your work can be part of your prayer. But I don't think it can be the whole thing. And here the Catechism of the Catholic Church, I quote from paragraph 2697. But we cannot pray at all times if we do not pray at specific times, consciously willing. We need to have an attitude of prayer at all times to think about listening to God. What does God want us to do in this moment? But if we're going to do that, we've got to take time to pray at specific moments, to cut out the hustle and bustle of life. You know, and that sometimes that's where we say with the hustle and bustle, Father, I don't have time to pray. Well, one, that's why I say start with ten minutes. If you can't even do ten, start with five. But make it a priority. If it's important to you, you're going to find the time. What can you let go of a little bit? The other thing we have to think about in prayer goes back to what I was saying before. Father, when I pray, I'm distracted 
buy things. I have, you know, I'm at Mass, but I keep thinking about this, that, and the other thing. Or I try and pray at home, and same thing. I pray this, that, and the other thing. And we spend a lot of time in prayer fighting all those thoughts, thinking we've got to defeat all those thoughts. We've got to answer all those thoughts. You know, and it's just thought after thought. I know sometimes the most peaceful moments I can have in a day is when I only have one thought in my head at the moment. Because we just get thoughts going in our head. And the phone's ringing with this, and while you're on, talking on the phone, um, you're sitting at the computer at the desk, or at least this is what happens to me, and the email's chiming at the same time, and you're trying to look at all that. And all those distractions are a challenge. Sometimes we put more effort into fighting them off, thinking, well, if I just defeat this thought, or if I just deal with it, it's not a problem. But sometimes, as hard as it seems to be, what we need to do is just let go of the thought. We don't have to thought answer every thought that comes in our head. It's not just in prayer. Anything we do, do we ever answer all the thoughts that come into our heads? Prayer is no different. We don't need to think about all those things. The Catechism, again, also speaks of distractions. When it says to hunt down our distractions in prayer are to fall into their trap. Think of it this way. You've decided you're going to start praying when you get home from work every day for 10 minutes. You sit down for that 10 minutes. You start to sit down and you think, oh, what am I going to make for dinner? I better get that figured out. Oh, what's thawed out? Oh, I think there's some chicken that's thawed out. Well, do I have the potatoes or the rice with the chicken? Oh, I don't have any instant potatoes. I don't have time to bake, boil the potatoes. So I guess I'll make, go, go with the rice. Um, and then, oh, a vegetable. What can we have for a vegetable? Oh. oh, okay. We'll have the green beans. Okay, we're having the chicken, the rice, and the green beans. That's all set. Now, what, how much time do I have left for prayer? I don't have any time left for prayer. Not that we don't have to think about what we're going to make for dinner. But stick to the prayer. That decision about dinner can wait. It will take care of itself. If the kid's screaming at you that they want their dinner, tell them to go cook it themselves. <laughs> you can tell them father said that. <laughs> so, you know, we fight all those distractions in prayer. Again, we don't have to deal with all of them. I don't know about you, throughout the day I have lots of thoughts that I never get to think about. They're, they come, if they're important, they come back. Going back to our prayers not being answered. You know, Father, I pray and I just don't seem to get my prayers answered. Well, let's look at Luke chapter 11 about this. I, and I tell you, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. And if you're one of those people who feels like you ask and you don't get what you want, you're probably thinking right now, Father, this passage doesn't help. It's exactly how I feel. And he says, Jesus says, ask and you shall receive. I ask and I don't receive. I seek God and I can't find Him. You know, and there's stereotypical answers we have for this, but they are real answers. You know, why aren't my prayers being answered? One of our standard answers for this can be, well, you were asking for something bad, and God's not going to give you something that's bad. You want to know something? That's a biblical answer. Following on the verse I just read, what father among you would hand his son a snake when he asked for a fish? Or hand him a scorpion when he asked for an egg? If you then, who are wicked, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Well, it turns out in those days, there was a snake that looked like a fish. He asked for the fish thinking, oh, the fish would be good to eat. And the snake wasn't. The snake was bad. But if you'd ask for the snake thinking it was that fish, but it really wasn't. It was something bad. Would you really want some God to give you that snake in that case? 
or the scorpion and the egg. The scorpion they're talking about, they say in that day, would curl up and look like a ball. It would look curled up. It was in the shape of an egg. Say, so oh, there's an egg. Give me that egg. I can fr cook that egg up, eat it. Egg would have been a good thing. Scorpions are poisonous, not good. Would you really want them to give you that scorpion? So there can be times when we ask for something thinking it is good, but we'd only find out later on it wasn't what we thought. But we can still say, but Father, there's times when I pray, I know I'm praying for something good. Give me something else. Well, one of our other standard answers can be God answers prayers in His time. Not an answer we like to hear. I think most of the time, if not all the time when we pray, we want an answer now. I'm praying for this. You know, I'm praying for my Aunt Judy who's sick in the hospital. I want her to get better now. I'm praying for my son who just lost his job. I want him to find another job now. Not three years from now. Now. But when we say God answers prayers in his, time, his own time, this is biblical too. Think of the story of Abraham and Sarah waiting for the promised child. And they kept waiting and waiting and waiting. And the same thing with Elizabeth and Zechariah, the parents of John the Baptist. Elizabeth was beyond the childbearing years when they had John the Baptist, when their prayers were finally answered. And when our prayers are answered after a long time, how do we respond? If you read in the first chapter of the book of Samuel, the first book of Samuel, you'll read the story of Hannah, who is mother of Samuel, who become a great prophet. And she's without children, and she prays for a long time before she's finally given a child. Then recognizing that child is a gift from God, she nurses him, and then when he's weaned, she takes him to the temple and dedicates him in service to the Lord, recognizing that he is a gift from God. She gives the child, Samuel, back to God, gives up the child she had been praying all along for, and, but then is blessed with more children. She trusted in God. We talk in the sense about the need to be persistent in prayer. And we do need, sometimes God wants us to keep asking, keep thinking about what it is we're asking. Here in chapter 18 of Luke's Gospel, we hear another parable about this. Then he told them about a parable, about the necessity for them to pray always without becoming weary. He said, there was a judge in a certain town who neither feared God nor respected any human being. And a widow in that town used to come to him and say, Render a just decision for me against my adversary. For a long time the judge was unwilling. But eventually he thought, While it is true that I neither fear God nor respect any human being, because this widow keeps bothering me, I shall del deliver a just decision for her, lest she finally come and strike me. The Lord said, pay attention to what the dishonest judge says. Will God not, then not secure the rights of his chosen ones who call out to him day and night? Will he be slow to answer them? I tell you, he will see to it that justice is done for them speedily. The judge gives in because the woman keeps bothering him. In our persistence, are we trying to nag God, to get God to give in? And what are we praying for? Sometimes when we ask God for something, we give him very specific things that we want. We tell him what we want the outcome to be, what we want to happen. This woman did not tell the judge what to decide. She asked for a just decision. And God always give us, gives us justice in our prayer. God always gives us what is good. He doesn't always give us what we ask for because it isn't always good. We can also think in prayer about how Jesus prayed, how Jesus taught his disciples to pray. You know, sometimes J Jesus says to pray in secret. Don't babble. Don't worry about lots of words. God already knows what we need. God does want us to speak aloud our needs 
to, to say them to him and to listen to what his response is. But a lot of words aren't always necessary. Again, and from chapter 18 of Luke's Gospel, we hear, He then addressed this parable to those who were convinced of their own righteousness and despised everyone else. Two people went up to the temple area to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Then the Pharisee took his position and spoke this prayer to himself. He said, O oh God, I thank you that I am not like the rest of humanity, greedy, dishonest, adulterous, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and pray tithes on my whole income. But the tax collector stood off at a distance and would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast and prayed, O oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, the latter went home justified, not the former. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Do we try and pray with lots of words? Do we think we look impressive when we can pray with lots of words? Or are we willing just to be like the tax collector, say, be merciful to me, a sinner? In prayer and conversation with God, a conversation be, can be good. But are we using lots of words, just thinking quantity, more quantity is better? When really we need to think about the quality of our prayer. Jesus frequently prayer, prays. He prays at all the important times in his life. Looking at Luke's gospel that we're using th this year in year C for our Sunday readings. In chapter 3, Jesus prays before his baptism. In chapter 6, he prays before sending out the twelve. In chapter 9, he prays before his trans before Jesus, uh, excuse me, before Peter's confession about who Jesus is. You are the Christ. It's this last Sunday we heard the story of the Transfiguration. There Jesus is praying on the mountaintop. And in chapter 11, Jesus is praying himself when the disciples ask, them, ask him to teach him, teach all of them to pray. And Jesus prays at the agony in the garden before he's arrested. We hear this in Matthew's Gospel, Mark's Gospel, Luke's Gospel. What does he pray? In each of those Gospels, in various words, we hear that he prays. Father, if this cup could pass from me, but not my will, but yours be done. Jesus prayed that he wouldn't have to be arrested, beaten, and crucified. But he said, Father, I want your will to be done. How much do we dictate what we want in our prayers? You know, we can recite our standard prayers and we you know, say, I pray for these intentions. And, but we ask ourselves, are we telling God what to do? Or are we listening to God? Are we handing it over to God? You know, and sometimes we want to use lots of words. But there's also meditative prayer. Perhaps one of the simplest ways for us to do meditative prayer is to pick up the Bible and read it. But I don't mean to hear to read it like a book. In meditative prayer, we would read a few verses. When something strikes us, stop and think about it. And, you know, and sometimes when we do this, we might only get through five verses in 15 minutes. The next time we might get through 15 verses. It doesn't matter. It's not about reading a chapter at a time. It's about spending time looking at the scriptures and seeing how it means to us. We can pray as families. We can pray as individuals. And but when we pray, again, what's our attitude? Are we trying to tell God what to do? Or are we surrendering to God's will? I think back to almost four years ago now, when my mother was in her final days before she died in a hospital. She had emphysema for 10 years, and in the final weeks had lung cancer, found too late to do anything about it because of the emphysema after smoking for 30 years. She was on a ventilator. I was already a priest at this point, and you might think I'd have some grandiose prayer to say. I did anoint her, of course, 
But beyond that, my prayers really that week were, God, just take care of her. I don't even have more words to say. And within a few days, she passed. And some would say, well, you prayed for God to take care of her. He didn't take care of her. Yes, he did. She was suffering. She'd been sick for 10 years and getting worse and worse with the emphysema and other health problems, the cancer at the end. and um, Actually, when they found the cancer, it wasn't just in the lungs. Um, she also had it in the back, it turned out. So she was in a lot of pain. God took all that pain away. So God did answer my prayers. Not necessarily in the way I would have preferred, but he did take care of her. And that's what we need to think about to pray. And that's where we turn to the best prayer we have. The best prayer in part because it comes from Jesus. When Jesus' disciples asked him, teach us how to pray, what does he teach them? The Lord's Prayer. We find it in Luke's Gospel in chapter 11. In Matthew's Gospel in chapter 6. And the, our Father, as we're used to it, the Lord's Prayer is the exact words we can read in chapter 6 of Matthew's Gospel. We pray it often. Every time we're at Mass, we pray the Lord's Prayer. You pray the Rosary, you pray it several times. Liturgy hours, morning and evening prayer included in Our Father. Lots of other prayers pray in Our Father. And sometimes we don't even know what else to pray for. What else we should say in prayer, we can just say in Our Father. But do we really just say it? Or do we pray it? Thinking about the words. Think of it this way. How, as the priest, how do I introduce the Lord's Prayer at Mass? It's with the same words now, with the new translations. At the Savior's command. The Savior's command. Jesus taught us to pray. At the Savior's command, and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say. We dare to say? Well, if we really think about what the Our Father says, what we're praying in it, then it takes courage to pray it. The Catechism of the Catholic Church outlines a lot of these thoughts about the Our Father um, in the paragraphs following 2800. It's on your reference sheet. It, um, but we think, let's think about those words. It begins, first off, Our Father, who art in heaven, our Father. Not some distant God, far away, not interested in what's going on. Our Father, who invites us to be in relationship with Him. Our Father, who watches over us and cares for us. And then there's seven petitions that follow. Hallowed be Thy name. Hallowed be Thy name. Let people see Your glory, Lord. Let people know how great they are. So they know how great you are. And we can have a part in this by telling God, tell, excuse me, telling other people about what God does for us. Saying, look what God has done for us. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. God, we know we'll know the fullness of your kingdom in heaven one day. But help us to know it now. Now it starts getting tougher. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done. Not my will, but God's will. When we pray, are we seeking God's will? Or are we trying to wrestle with God? Trying to change God's will so He'll do what we want? Thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread. Here's a good one. We should think, God, give me what I need to do your will. Give me what I need to get through the challenges, the sufferings I face in my life. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. And forgive us our trespasses. Seem easy. Of course, we want to be forgiven. But if we want to be forgiven, we have to admit what we need to be forgiven for. We have to admit our sins. That isn't always easy, is it? We don't like to admit when we've done something wrong. But if we want to be forgiven, we have to. But then that second part, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Oh, makes me think of Bob. Bob really hurt me when he did that. I, can't, I don't know how I can forgive him. But if we want to be forgiven, 
we need to be willing to forgive others. And lead us not into temptation. Boy, Lord, we face lots of temptations in our lives. Help me to stay away from them. But deliver us from evil. When we can't stay away from the temptations, Lord, help us to keep from giving them into them. These are the words of the Lord's Prayer. The Catechism of the Catholic Church describes in 2761, says the Lord's Prayer is the summary of the whole gospel. It really tells us what Jesus calls us to, to seek to do the Father's will, to seek to do what he calls us to. It's a challenge, but we do dare to pray these words. But yet, we still struggle in that prayer. Sometimes we can still say, Father, I just can't seem to find God's presence. I, I just don't think he's listening to my prayers. Well, here perhaps we need to think about what breaks our relationship with God that we wouldn't know his presence. It's called sin. And sometimes when we can't find God's presence, the thing we need to do is confess our sins. Ask God to wipe the slate clean. It's why he gives us the gift of the sacrament of reconciliation. We pray in various ways. We pray at various times. The one thing we all do together that should always be seen as prayer is Mass. Think about what we do at Mass. How do we begin Mass? How do we begin all our prayers? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right there alone can be a prayer. <coughs> Father, who we're in relationship with. Son, Jesus, who died for us. Holy Spirit, guiding us, helping us, giving us courage and wisdom. And, and all in the shape of the sign of the cross. Remembering what Jesus did for us. Mass, we listen to readings from the Bible. Not to listen to sto nice stories. To listen to what God is saying to us. And broken open for us in the homilies. And we pray a creed. The creed isn't just a bunch of words either. It's a basic summary of what we believe in, in the Trinity, and God's presence. His role is our creator. We bring forth gifts of bread and wine. The Eucharistic prayer, you know, some people will say, you know, wouldn't it be simpler if we just come to church, get communion, and leave? But in the Eucharistic, I, I have really had people say, make that comment. I hope they weren't serious. <laughs> uh, but you know, in the Eucharistic prayer, listening to the words of consecration and recalling what Jesus went through for us, his sacrifice that he makes for us, says something to us. We pray the Our Father at Mass. I already talked about that. The sign of peace. Seeking God's peace. Seeking to be at peace with one another. We receive communion, strengthened by the body and blood of Jesus. And then the final prayer dismissal. And not just to go home and forget about church. Dismissal. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your lives. Take what we've learned. Go out and live it. These are the ways we pray. The Catechism of the Catholic Church describes prayer as the action of God and man. Sometimes we think it's something we do all about, we, something, prayer is something we do. But the Catechism also says in 2567, prayer starts with God. We pray because God calls us to know Him in prayer. And prayer continues with our response. Prayer isn't all about what we say. We pray often, you know, we can pray when we need something, when we know we need God's help, we pray asking Him for Him. For Him. How often do we remember in our prayers to thank God? It's very easy to remember to ask Him for something. How often do we thank God? And sometimes, how much do we pray just praising God? Saying, God, you're wonderful. You're creator. Everything you create is good. Prayer is not easy. Prayer has no simple answers. But it's, to me, the thing we can work on is our attitude, our openness, coming to pray, to say to God, these are the things I think I need. But God, tell me what it is that I really am to do. 
Think of the prayer, the, the Our Father. Think of Jesus' prayer at the agony in the garden. Father, if this cup could pass from me, but not my will, but yours be done. These are the prayers that God calls us to. The, to know Him. God wants to help us in our prayers. God wants to be with us, for us to know His presence. And we give thanks for all He does for us. And seek Him in all things. In a moment, I'll open it up to questions, but a couple notes before we do. We do have the handout over here, if you didn't get one already, with the scriptural references on it and the catechism references. Over on the table to this side, um, there are a few different items. If you're standing, looking at the table, um, on the left there are, there's a CD on prayer you're welcome to take. Um, in the middle, if you were at Mass this weekend, you heard me announce that we've recorded a video on rec the Sacrament of Reconciliation. That video is available on our parish website and on my, my own website, renewalfaith.org, under the sacrament section. There in the middle of the table are the booklets that um, this weekend were in the conf outside the confessional. If you didn't already pick them up, there's three different ones. One on why I see the sacrament as a gift. One... Um, on examination of conscience and one on how to go to confession. So if you feel you need to wipe the slate clean, um, <laughs> those are there to help you with that. Lastly, during the Our Father, I mentioned with the hallowed be thy name, that we need to tell other people about the good things God does for us. Well, the response people say sometimes is, I don't know how to tell people. I don't know what words to use. I don't know how I'm to share my faith. Um, glad you asked the question. On March 18th, um, uh, which is another Monday night, I will be doing a presentation entitled, Talking About God, How We Share Our Faith. Um, I'm sure it will be a wonderful talk. I'll know more after I write the talk. <laughs> but again, in a moment, I'll open it for questions. But how about, at our Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Questions? Uh, some time ago, uh, I read about Thomas Merton, and what you said earlier about the dryness of prayer reminded me of what he said, the, dry, the darkness of the soul, and he was suffering intensely with mm -hmm. these prayers, and he felt were totally dry. Mm -hmm. And then it was found out that he had fathered a daughter, and he was terribly guilty about this. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess my question is, if guilt and psychological problems get into the middle of a person's life, uh, it must be awfully hard to overcome. I don't know if he ever came to his problem. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't determine that from my reading. But I wondered about the Guilt, guilt and prayer. For those who didn't hear the question, she spoke of Thomas Merton, who um, is who's known as a great speaker of faith and wrote lots of things, gave lots of talks, but who had issues of guilt. He found out he had fathered a child and had guilt issues about that and things. And how does the role guilt plays in trying to, to know God and how do we let go of that? Um, the answer, of course, in terms of the sacrament is going to confession. But I know sometimes when we go to confession, I think there's times in our lives when it's easier for God to forgive our sins than it easy f is for us to forgive ourselves. We go to confession, we f get God's forgiveness, and we still keep thinking about it. You know, it's hard to let go of those things. We know they are part of who we are. Even when God has forgiven them, even when every person involved has forgiven us, they are still part of who we are. And sometimes we think about 
how we can change things, you know, how we'd like to change this or that. And in prayer, I think, you know, sometimes that, that, that's where we need to turn to prayer and saying, just say to God, God, I keep thinking about this. I wish I could change this, but I can't change the past. But what can I do to make the best of the future? But guilt, again, is a powerful thing. But, you know, just like let, letting go of all the distractions in prayer sometimes seems so difficult. You know, there can be that one thing, you know, in the past, or maybe a couple things or something we know we did, and we wish we hadn't done it um, without breaking the seal of confession. I'll say sometimes when people um, come to confession, they say they haven't been in 20 years. The thing that's more on their mind is something from 15 years ago than last week. Because last week they said, oh, I did fairly well, but I know what I did 20, 15, 20 years ago, and I'm having a harder time with that. Um, and if you, if you got something you haven't confessed, confess it. Beyond that, it, I think it's asking God in our prayers to see, you know, part of it can be, I can't change the past, God, but is there something I can do to make things as best as they can be today. And if not, then how do I let go? How do I go forward? Because God's let go of that past. God's already done his part. You know, how do we move forward? How do we find that openness to God? Because we have little to gain by holding on to the past. Again, do what we can, confess it. If there's something we can do to rectify something, do it. But then to move forward, just, we'll, nev we'll never, find our way home, so to speak, if we keep thinking about the past and things that we can't do something about. Turn it over to God. As hard as that is, I could say it's easier for God to forgive us sometimes than it is for us to forgive ourselves. Other questions? Uh, do you have some advice to achieving clarity and discernment? Clarity and discernment. Uh, advice for clarity and discernment. Um, well, cl clarity in thought, again, you have all those distraction issues, you know, and discernment, you know, sometimes it is to, you know, it starts with even asking um, the question, what are we trying to find? You know, what, if we're talking about discernment, there's some decision we face. Um, you know, and it can be, first off, asking God, do we even have all the options on the table? And I, you know, and with, when I think about putting options on a table, evaluating decisions, part of the prayer of discernment is the human things we might do to weigh the pros and the cons, to see everything that's before us. A prayer of discernment is not to say to God, you know, say you're facing a job choice and you're so fortunate um, to, as to have a couple choices of what God to, job to take. It isn't just to say to God, okay, I'm going to sit here and pray, and you tell me what job I'm supposed to take. <laughs> Come on, God. I'm waiting for the answer. You know, we should take it to prayer, but to weigh, what do I like about this job? What don't I like? Where am I using the gifts that God gives me in this job? Where would be the struggles? To, but to that, that clarity comes in part from working through those questions that are human questions but then to say, what is God's will in all of that? I go back to the example um, I've used in other settings of my decision to come here, whether or not I was going to apply to become pastor here. When I first started, have, when it became open, when I knew Father Leo was going to be leaving and that this would be open, I started thinking about all the human questions I could ask. And some of those questions are real and maybe needed to be asked. Um, but then I thought about, well, wait a minute, the real question to ask is where does God want me to be? Because if it's where God wants me to be, he'll make the human things work out. Um, now when you're praying about being a pastor of a church, it might be a little bit different decision than jobs, you know, a, a secular job. But God can still be part of that. You know, I don't care if the job is sweeping streets or being a doctor. God can direct us where we can use our gifts, where we can make a difference in the world. So to go through the, the human things, the questions that need to be asked about, you know, like in a job selection, but then to say to God, okay, 
I've weighed all this out. Where do I go from here? Other questions? Well, just two questions. I guess I did a really good job. <laughs> <laughs> Answered all, everything, right? So. Does, play, uh, does prayer always have to be a formal prayer? Uh, you, you mentioned uh, various ways, you know, it, it, mm -hmm. it, uh, it, uh, 40 hours and, and other, but they're always in, in a very formal setting, mm -hmm. very formal prayers mm -hmm. that the church has mm -hmm. handed on down through the mm -hmm. But there are times when you just need a good old conversation with yeah. God. That it can happen when you're ironing mm -hmm. something, mm -hmm. and, you, and you iron away and you're Maybe you're arguing with God, but maybe mostly Jesus. Jesus is my brother. First off, I try and avoid ironing. I don't do a good job. These things are wash and wear. Um, and my elves are wash and wear. The, the chasubles, the outside robes, they're dry cleaned only. Um, but does prayer have to be formal all the time? Absolutely not. And if it's always formal, to me it's missing something. Although I will say, if it's what works for you, like some people, um, when they pray a rosary, can be praying in other ways because we know the words so well. We can repeat them over and over. And it draws us into a spirit of prayer. That we can be think, praying the rosary and be thinking about, you know, what does God want me to do with these different things. And that's, where, that's part of what the rosary is meant to help us do at times. So there's, you're doing formal prayer and the other. I made a reference earlier, I believe, to, um, you know, sometimes the most peaceful moments I can have is when I just have a single thought in my head. You're just, you may be doing something, you're, um, sometimes for me, the most relaxed feelings I have is when I take a walk, which is why this cold winter and snow um, doesn't get along with me because I don't get the walks in and that. Um, just walking and not trying to think about anything, not thinking about prayer, not thinking about all the things sitting on my desk, just letting the thoughts go. But then in the midst of that, even though I'm not deliberately praying, that the clarity comes to find the presence of God. And ultimately, I think when we're talking about prayer and the presence of God, that the pres that feeling when we can be aware of that presence, whether it's you know in the moment of ironing or out taking a walk or whatever we're doing, that presence of God, when we can feel that, not that we feel it anywhere near as much as we would love to, that presence is worth far more than a lot of words of prayer sometimes. So, do we need to always pray formally? Absolutely not. I encourage you sometimes, just if, 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 it, if you can find a way to make it work for you, that you just take, take time to just let the thoughts be what they are. Other questions? Okay. Well, thank you for coming tonight. I'd like to thank our ladies who put together our hospitality with all the wonderful um, refreshments and juices and drinks over there. Feel free to help yourself to some before you. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge our evangelization team, um, which some are here today, Chris Elise, Justin Greenlee, Justin's wife, Emily, is also part of it. Um, Maureen Seeley, I see, is back there. Mary Etzel Galway. Um, Roy Erb is here. Um, Frank Smith is also part of it, but he couldn't be here tonight because of another of a conflict for him. Is that everybody on the team? Um, if I'm forgetting anybody, I'm sorry. But they, they help coordinate the things for this, help coming up with the flyers and things. and. Um, I probably was annoying them on email at times, bouncing off ideas of where we would go with these talks. So they were helpful in getting the ideas, some of the initial ideas together. So we thank them for their efforts and thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you.